And, and for our panelists, just as best practice, when you're not speaking, if you want to mute yourself, that is fantastic. And for everyone joining us right now, thank you and welcome. And we'll give you just another minute to let everybody file through before we begin, to, before we begin today's presentation. All right, well, we are at the top of the hour. So thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar. This is our monthly edge user group. Just a couple of housekeeping items while everybody gets settled. We are using the Zoom webinar platform for today's webinar. So your mics and cameras are disabled by default. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please use the chat function and select all panelists and we will work with you directly to sort it out. If at any time during the webinar you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function. Please note that we will be holding questions until after the presentation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to ACRO's Deputy Director, Melanie Gottlieb. Thank you so much, Anetta. I'm Melanie Gottlieb, Deputy Director of ACRO, and I'd like to welcome you to the November version of the EDGE User Group. We know that you are all very busy and so we thank you for joining us as you close out your week um, and enter the holiday time. I'm hoping that many of you will have some extra time off this week. Um, as always, we're hopeful that our technology will not fail us. This is a large Zoom call and we at ACRO, like many of you, remain working from home at the mercies of our home Wi-Fi. We missed our opportunity to engage with you in person this year at the ACRO annual meeting, but we are looking forward to engaging with you at our virtual annual meeting, which will be in March. Um, so we'll look for more information on that later. You may use the chat freely while on this webinar. If you have a question for the panelists, we ask that you use the Q&A section and we'll get it into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please note which panelists that you are asking the question of if that question is specific to them. Joining me today is uh, Jasmine Saidi Kunert, and I'll let her introduce the members of the IESC who have joined. Also with me is Drew Carlisle, Associate Director of Act at ACRO. Before I turn the mic over, I would like to just uh, ask one quick poll question of all of you here today. Um, I'd like to have a sense of what segment of the EDGE population you represent. Are you institution-based staff? Are you at an evaluation service? Are you with a government entity? Are you with a law firm? And then second, is this your first user group? Um, you should be able to see that poll. And if you can answer that question in the pop-up in the poll, that would be great. And Looks like you are all pretty quick on this, which is excellent. I'm going to give it about five more seconds. And it looks like most of we most people have answered. So I'm going to end the poll. And I'm going to share the results. So it looks like we are 94% institutional staff, 6% evaluation service staff. And we are nearly 50-50, 49% of you, this is your first user group, and 51% of you are return uh, users for the user group. So thank you, welcome. And with that, I am going to turn the mic over to Jasmine. Thank you, and hello everybody. It's great to be here with everyone. Uh, thanks, Melanie for uh, the introduction and uh, for many of you who've joined us before and for those of you who are new, I'd like to just to get, give you a brief uh, update and uh, overview of the IESC, who we are, what we do, and then we'll go through some of the, the work in progress and some of the works that we've completed in the past month. Um, as Melanie uh, indicated, I'm currently the chair of the International Education uh, Standards Council, IESC. We're the body that oversees the country profiles and the credential advice that you see in EDGE. 
Today, I'm joined on the panel by uh, several members of the IESC, and I'd like to introduce them to you. We have Nancy Katz, who represents the Devaluation Service in Chicago, Illinois. We have Emily Tse, who represents the International Education Research Foundation. We have Robert Watkins, who is with the University of Texas, Austin. We have Dale Goff, who represents the Foreign Credential Services of America, FCSA. And we also have Johnny Johnson, who is uh, formerly with the Peninsula, uh, Monterey Peninsula College and currently with FCSA. We also have Bill Paver, uh, representing FCSA and representing ACRO. We have Ann Koenig, who is our liaison, and Drew Carlisle. Uh, another member uh, that is not present today is Jennifer Mink, who is with Tarrant County College District in Texas. The IESC has six voting members, and those are Nancy Katz, Emily Tse, Robert Watkins, Johnny Johnson, Jennifer Mink, and yours truly. We are a volunteer assembly of experienced professionals. We've been in this field for many years that I don't want, if we add it up, I think it exceeds 100. So you can pretty much <laughs> have the confidence that we've, we've, we've been around this block more than once or twice. Many of us, uh, I think all of us have participated in international education research projects. We have authored several publications and co-authored and are very active in the field. We are the international education credential wonks. We get really <laughs> caught in the weeds of our field and we enjoy the work we do. This is, as I said, volunteer, no one gets paid. We, we just like the, the punishment, <laughs> it goes with the territory. So uh, one of the things that you probably wonder is how we approach uh, the country profiles or the information that you see on edge. Much of it is based on uh, inquiries we receive from edge subscribers who bring to our attention something that they feel is missing or something that may need to be upgraded. And those of us on the IESC, we also bring up-to-date information to the table and we, based on the personal research that we do, and we bring it to everyone's attention that, okay, this particular country is missing this credential or new things are happening, we need to address it. Um, Made all the decisions that you see that have been reached in the credential advice and the cre uh, grading scales are based on a majority consensus. We take votes and the majority consensus is what then um, reaches the, the, the final decisions that uh, you see on the credential advice. So that's kind of our general approach. I think what we will demonstrate to you is just to go through the agenda. If we could see the next slide, please. And the next one, please. So today's agenda, we will be touching on some of the country profiles that we have been, that, that have been updated, uh, that includes some research projects and reports that have been published. Then we will tackle some uh, of the latest country updates and then some of the works in progress. And of course, we will wrap it up with a, a Q and A. Next slide, please. So in terms of some of the publications, we've been very busy. Those who have been contributing to the Acro Edge endeavors have uh, culminated in the following pu publications. We have the Cuba Project White Paper. This is now available for you. The link is on this slide. This gives you an update on the project that took place, I believe, two years ago. Um, then we have a country profile for EDGE, Macedonia. This has been prepared, is currently under review for approval of the credential advice, the, the ladder and the grading scale. Uh, so once the IAC has approved this, then this will be posted onto ACRO, uh, the EDGE profile. Cuba country profile for EDGE has been prepared by Janine Nicole Pacheco with the University of New Mexico. This has been completed and is currently under review for by IESC for final approval. And the offshore medical schools in the Caribbean, this is a work in progress, our fellows. Uh, we have two fellows that have been elected for this year, uh, Lloyd Utley with Texas A&M in Corpus Christi and um, Rosalie, um, gosh, I'm blanking on the last Hancock. name. <laughs> thank you, Rosalie Hancock. Hancock. Thank you, with Bellevue, with Bellevue College. 
and they are putting together a very comprehensive list of uh, offshore medical schools in the Caribbean and their accreditation status. This is going to be an extremely valuable tool for those of us in the evaluation world. And we're really looking forward to this project to be uh, the final project. Um, so let's go to our next slide. And this is where uh, we will begin to tackle the various country updates that we've been addressing just in the uh, past month that they've come to conclusion. Our first country is the uh, Nepal and we're looking at the diploma of dental surgery and my colleague Emily Tsai will be giving an update on this. All right, on to the next slide. Uh, so uh, one of the great assets for EDGE, of course, are our users and the feedback that we receive. So recently it was noted that uh, we have the medical degree as well as the veterinary medicine degree, but not its counterpart in dental medicine. Uh, so we looked into this, it's rather straightforward. The profile is very similar. Uh, there is indeed the BDS or Bachelor of Dental Surgery in Nepal, five and a half years of study after high school. So we included that and made that comparable uh, to the first professional degree in dentistry. On to the next slide. Also in Nepal, a user uh, noticed that we had not yet uh, referenced the reforms, uh, particularly at the secondary level. Uh, so uh, we looked into this as well, and indeed it was not in there. Uh, the reforms were actually introduced in 2016 with the new credentials being issued in 2017. So first, uh, before it was the Higher Secondary Education Board, now it is the National Examinations Board. At the end of grade 10, it was previously the school leaving certificate, but is now the Secondary Education Examination, or SEE, which you see an example of on your right. Next slide. And then following that, at the end of grade 12, Previously, it was the higher secondary certificate, but it is now the School Leaving Certificate Examination, or SLCE. Now you can see this is potentially confusing because of the overlapping terminology with the former grade 10 School Leaving Certificate. But luckily, when you look at the documentation, there are some tells, of course, the year of issue. Uh, you just have to be wary of which calendar system is being used. If it's the Bikram Samwat calendar in Nepal, or the Western calendar. If it's not the Western calendar, you have to subtract 56 years. Uh, but 2017 onwards, you should see the new credentials. You also want to make note of the examinations board. Again, now it should be the National Examinations Board with the current credential names. What's also nice is that next to the credential name, uh, they do now indicate the grade or year. So in this example, you'll see it does say grade 11 and 12 in Roman numerals. Next slide. And then for the SEE, it does say grade 10 next to it. So along with that, we made these updates uh, with the um, recommendations of comparability to completion of grade 10 and completion of senior high school respectively. Next slide. And of course, we updated the overview to reflect these changes in educational reforms. That's it for Nepal. Thank you so much, Emily, thank you. Um, next slide, please. And this will be uh, presented by uh, my colleague, Johnny Johnson. Uh, we received this query from an S subscriber on Peru. They needed more clarification on the uh, titulo grado de bachiller and the titulo profesional de licenciado or licenciado. And Johnny will provide this additional information. Go ahead, Johnny. He's Sorry, muted. John, you, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. No, you're not reading lips this morning. Okay. Um, so the titulo uh, grado de bachiller is, uh, is the, um, this, this slide ha uh, hasn't been uh, corrected, but uh, anyway, we can work with what's here. Uh, that is the academic degree. It also is, uh, I don't, uh, title doesn't belong there, just academic, it's a degree. Then the titulo profesional and the licenciado, they're both, uh, the licenciado is a degree and a title. And the, of course, title by its name is a, 
I mean, Titolo is title. Um, the other, this has all been rewritten for, and there are two uh, paragraphs which summarize the whole entire first cycle, meaning the bachelor's level. Um, so um, that that's all. I th just stay tuned. It'll be you could uh, uh, find it on edge uh, by tomorrow, probably. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny. Our next slide, please, would be on the country of India, and this is about the credential diploma in engineering. And my colleague Nancy Katz will provide you an update on on this credential. Good afternoon, all. We had a question from an EDGE user about um, the Diploma in Engineering as it relates to the Bachelor of Engineering in India and wondering if the, if the Bachelor of Engineering was a three-year program after a three-year uh, official program after completion of the Diploma in Engineering. The slide that you're seeing now is what is written in EDGE about the credential. What we did was that we wanted to clarify, if you could go to the next side, slide, please. Thank you. We wanted to clarify this and we added a note into the um, profile of both the Diploma in Engineering as well as the Bachelor of Engineering to make it very clear that individuals that receive the Diploma in Engineering, if they wish to go into a four-year Bachelor of Engineering or Bachelor of Technology program, that they could be exempted for one year of the four-year program. It is 100% a four-year program, even though they may only complete three years of study. If you receive a degree certificate, a Bachelor of Engineering or Bachelor of Technology, that is three years, you should ask your student or applicant for the diploma in engineering. That's the tell, because at Bachelor of Engineering, Bachelor of Technology is indeed four years. So we did some additional research. I believe this is already posted in EDGE. And just to clarify this, this also goes in line with, um, a, if those of you familiar with education in Israel, they have a Honda Sai program, which is a two year uh, what they call practical engineer. It's a very similar to this diploma in engineering, whereas that individuals with the Israeli Honda Sai um, qualification can be exempted for one year of a Bachelor of Engineering program in Israel if their grades are high enough. So we wanted to make sure that also that the wording for India was in line with the wording in Israel because they were the same um, I hate to use the animal, but it was the same, a similar type of a qualification. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Next slide is on Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. We uh, looked at the credential, the Diploma of Engineering, Diploma d'Ingenieur, and uh, my colleague Robert Watkins will provide you with an update on this credential. Thanks, Jasmine. <clears throat> yes, um, once again, from uh, uh, an EDGE user, we got a message that said, um, you don't seem to have the Diplôme d'Ingenieur included in the uh, entry for Democratic Republic of Congo. Looked in there and sure enough, we didn't. <clears throat> and I think our, well, sometimes when we were rolling out EDGE, we, we made some assumptions. One of the assumptions we made was that we could get away with some generic entries that covered a lot of bases but without having to name them all. Well, that's not really the best way to provide the most uh, helpful uh, database. And so uh, we realized that just because we had the entry for the licence, which is two years after the first diploma in DRC, which is the graduate, um, we, we thought maybe people would figure out that the engineering diploma was also uh, folded into that license, uh, but then it, it became clear that we needed to be more explicit. So um, we <clears throat> went ahead and recently included the entry for uh, uh, the Diplôme d'Ingenieur. It, it, it acts just like the license. First, af after high school, one gets a three-year graduate diploma. That's the first diploma in DRC. And then subsequently you can get a license and maybe the arts and sciences 
or you can get an engineering degree, the Diplôme d'Ingenieur, and that's what it is. It's five years total uh, post high school education and our credential advice is bachelor's degree. And as you can see, the entry requirements, the Diplôme de Gradué and um, says leads yeah, either employment or further ed. Most engineers would probably go into pr practice, but you could also go on for a higher degree as well. That's it. Thank you, Robert. Our next country and next slide is on Ukraine. And this is an update on the higher education grading scale. And my colleague, Anne Tony from ACRO will be presenting. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. The question about the Ukraine grading scale came up in a question that was posed in the ACRO International Activities Listserv. So that's another resource for you. And the question revolved around the grade that trans, the verbal grade that translates as past. And uh, when I reviewed that, I realized that there was a typo in the grading scale, the way it was written in EDGE. So we corrected that typo. It, it incorrectly showed the grade that translates as pass as English fail. So that was a huge major typo. So we've corrected that. Thank you very much for the, the question on that. And we apologize for the confusion. The question was about how do I calculate the grades and a grading a grade average with these fail grades when the person passed. So um, we've corrected that. And next slide, please. We're going to be updating the grading scale for Ukraine. Um, basically, the official or the national grading scale are, is the verbal grading scale, the three uh, grades of excellent, good, and satisfactory. And there you see them printed in both Ukrainian and the English translation. Those grades are called differentiated grades. If you're looking at a diploma supplement with a, that comes with a Ukrainian diploma and you read through the grading section, it'll describe differentiated grades and undifferentiated grades. So the differentiated grades are the three verbal grades, excellent, good, and satisfactory. And then the grade of pass, which was the one in question, uh, Zarahovano means past, in a subject that is graded on a pass-fail basis. So there is no other qualitative assessment. Uh, it's not graded as excellent, good, satisfactory. It's just pass or fail. Um, pass indicating that the student completed all of the requirements for the subject. And then institutions can create their own grading scales based on these uh, three verbal ranges and so you will see this on the diploma supplements. Um, you might see the ECTS grading scale listed there. You might see some combinations of the ECTS scale with a numerical scale. Very common to see a percentage scale and the percentage ranges that go with these differentiated grade ranges of excellent, good and satisfactory can be different from one institution to another. So if you have a diploma, a completed degree program, by law, the student is, um, it get, receives a diploma supplement. So that gives you a lot of information about the program. If the program hasn't been completed, you should get on the documentation, the grading scale. It should be listed on there. So the three grades of excellent, good, satisfactory are the, um, the, the national scale. And then the institutions can interpret that uh, uh, they're free to interpret it in their way, and they should tell you what they're doing. And another thing to know is that failing grades should never appear on an official document. Those are the updates for Ukraine. Also, um, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to, to join us today. Uh, Drew Carlisle just uh, if you ever send an email to Edge or you reach out to contact us, there's a good chance that I'm gonna be the person on the other end of that. Uh, so just wanted to introduce myself for anyone that hasn't had uh, an interaction with me before. Uh, when you have, when you identify something that you believe that um, the IESC would be able to assist with, um, specifically credentials that are not reflected within the database, um, that's something that we really do want to hear from you about. Please do some preliminary research that'll make it easier for our team 
uh, to understand the context in which this credential is placed. And when you, when you reach out, we are trying to uh, get this turned around and get the information into the database as quickly as possible. Morocco, for example, that's something that's just come into effect this year at the beginning of the semester, and we're working to go ahead and get that reflected there. Um, we'll also talk a little bit more about what's happening in uh, terms of Nigeria and India with some of those updates that are coming down the pike. Um, but thank you so much for reaching out. You can always send us an email at edge at acro.org or with the new uh, interface with Edge 3.0, there are opportunities to contact us and submit an update on every single page within the database. So please reach out and we look forward to your questions. Next slide. And let me hand this over. Johnny, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Again? Okay, sorry. Um, They've decided in Morocco to and passed a law saying as much that they want to change from the LMD uh, three year uh, bachelor's, uh, two year master's. That is, this, uh, they're, they're, a lot of countries are following uh, ECTS, not only in grading, but in the structure of the education system. And as Drew said, this could, the, these students just started about eight weeks ago. So we could put this in edge, except we're not sure uh, what I've seen in the press and heard through back channels is that they, they've uh, realized that this might be a mistake and they're gonna go back to the three year. So whether they do or not, we'll still have the, uh, the years here that, and when they did the experiment and then when they ended the experiment. Uh, but right now, these people who started eight weeks ago should graduate in uh, spring of 2024. Um, oh, and while I have the floor, I just go back, I, I kind of bobbled Peru. And I just want to uh, mention that uh, the slide, forget the slide, you'll, you'll have it all in, in edge because the slide says that most people get the uh, licenciado and the titolo at the same time uh, because there are several, there are extra steps that one or requirements that one must complete. Uh, it's not always, it's, it's not always possible unless they delayed getting the licenciado, which as I said before, is both a, an academic degree and a title, but they can't practice the profession until they have done some uh, additional work and that often takes an extra year. Uh, and and um, some of that extra work could be in the form of comprehensive exams or a thesis or a six month internship uh, with a report. So, uh, and, and, and to become an attorney, they also require a one year work placement. Again, that's all gonna be in edge in the overview and in the, uh, throughout their profile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Um, our next country in progress is the foundation year program from Nigeria. Uh, and I will have uh, Robert uh, give us an update on this credential. There you go, Robert. Sure, thanks, Jasmine. And, and as you, the reason this is still <laughs> a work in progress is because we haven't completely run this down yet. Um, once again, an edge user um, sent in this document, first without the document, but just described it to us. And most of us were saying, what? We've never heard of a foundation program in Nigeria, we certainly, uh, see them in Australia, we see them in uh, uh, the UK, we see them in some other place, Anglophone countries, but not really Nigeria. Nigeria has, has been somewhat familiar to us for quite some time, at least since the late 80s when they departed from the O levels and the A levels uh, in Nigeria and went to a national um, exam system of the West African Secondary School Certificate Examination. Then one could go on and do a two year what used to be called an ordinary national diploma, but later was simplified to simply national diploma. 
and then two years subsequent to that could do a higher national diploma <clears throat> at, at a polytechnic, generally speaking. Um, but we've never heard of a foundation year program. Um, this one is dated a few years back, as you can see. Um, so one of the problems I had as I tried to run this down was to go on the website for this <clears throat> particular institute at this particular federal university. And they described now, that is 2020, they only offer um, pre-degree programs, A-level type programs. If you wanna go somewhere outside of Nigeria, they also have uh, uh, the West African School Certificate uh, equivalent and so forth. They don't seem to offer this foundation program. So after staring at it for a while and talking amongst ourselves, we finally came to the conclusion and it helped when the, the edge user sent in the rest of uh, the academic information on this particular individual, because what happened was, and we still don't know whether they finished the, the WASSCE or not, probably they did, but possibly not. But what we find is, is that when you look at the first two semesters of this program, you see that they're all, the courses are all called foundational. <clears throat> and then the second year, they're no longer called that. And the courses look very much like standard first year courses of any degree program in Nigeria. And so what we, the, the, what we finally came to was is that for some reason, the, the, the foundation piece, and since this is a science program, possibly they finished their high school, but didn't concentrate in science enough. And so now they're giving them these two semesters of foundational science coursework. And then they move on to the second year, which as it turns out, and if we'll go to the next slide, you'll see that after finishing the two year program, the foundation year, and then that first year, that, that second year, which is essentially a first year of a degree program, this person ends up getting placed in year two of a bachelor's degree program in uh, de dental sciences. So clearly the Nigerians, or at least the receiving institution, decided that they were gonna use the foundation year as sort of a prep to, to, to be admissible to, one of the, to this professional program, which as you can imagine, are pretty popular. Most dental, vet med, medical and, and law programs are all pretty, pretty popular because of what it can lead to ultimately in terms of the professions. And so then places them in the second year of that four year degree program. So we don't have all the transcript there so you can't see the remainder of it. But you, what this is designed to illustrate for you is that this person gets plopped down in year two because those are 200 level courses as you can see on the document on the left. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you, Robert. And as uh, Drew just typed in in the, in the chat, uh, if you have a credential, uh, we'd love to see it because it really helps the, the IASC to uh, can get a, f a complete feel for what this educational document is. Um, but please be sure to redact all the sensitive information, delete the applicant's name, their ID numbers, any of those necessary things, because we are very um, careful about protecting uh, the privacy of the individuals. But if you have the documents, it's really helpful for us um, because kind of reading a little blurb is not as clar <laughs> clarifying. So it's really helpful to see the actual physical document. And thank you so much for that, Robert. Uh, you'll be next again, Robert. This is about the four-year bachelor degree from India. And this is a question that came up in last month's user guide. And uh, we decided to take this on and we're still working on it. But Robert has some updates. Go ahead, Robert. Thanks. Uh, yes. Um, you know, when I first came into this field, um, all right, 43 years ago, <laughs> I'll go ahead and say it. Um, it was pretty simple. India was fairly simple. Once they, once they got around all the different state uh, secondary school systems, it, India was pretty straightforward. You had uh, three-year bachelor's degrees and those were usually Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, <clears throat> Bachelor of Commerce. And then they had four-year degrees, which were the Bachelor of Technology and the Bachelor of Engineering. And a few other science degrees that, that are professional degrees that might be four years or even more possibly like dental sciences and so forth. Um, so that made India fairly simple. And because most of us see across our desks Indian documents a good deal of the time, um, 
India, Edge India tends to be uh, probably the most robust um, entry in all of Edge um, because of uh, that very reason. So imagine our consternation <laughs> when it turns out that an Edge user has a Bachelor of Arts Honors degree, which historically in India simply meant like, like in Britain, that it was simply more concentrated in the third year and not any longer. In Australia, it's longer. In Ontario, it's longer, but not in India, not in the UK. So imagine our amazement when we see a four-year honors uh, degree from India. Now, here's our problem. Uh, as a matter of fact, it wasn't so amazing to me because not, not a couple of weeks before that, um, one of my evaluators at UT had come forward with the same thing. It wasn't the same person, but it was the same school and the same degree. So I went on the website of the school, which by the way is Pandit Dindayal Petroleum University in Gandhi Nagar, which is uh, outskirts of uh, Delhi. And sure enough, they're mainly, they're, they're main, as the name implies of the, of the university, Petroleum University, they're mainly an engineering school with engineering degrees and BTEC degrees, which historically have always been four years. So what's interesting is, is they've decided that four years is the model. And so even with their arts honors degrees, they have them as four year full-time degrees. Now, here's our dilemma. <clears throat> In Edge, we decided from the very beginning of rollout, uh, some 15 years or more ago, that we didn't want to mention names of institutions um, in the body, in the credential pages and the overview and things like that. And the reason for that is, is that for a while there, we were getting, when we did, we were getting constant emails from um, usually immigrants from India that had come over and said, why is my school not in edge? And so pretty quickly it began to appear, appear to us that folks were looking for the their school's name in edge because they knew how important edge had become and they wanted to see their name in lights, their school's name in lights. So we decided that we didn't want to reference individual institutions. We might say something generic like we do in the grading page of the IITs, which when they got started in, in the middle 60s were only seven campuses, but now are 20 odd campuses. Point is, is that we can, we'll mention them in a generic sense, the IITs, but we won't say IIT Delhi or IIT Kampur or whatever. So we're trying to stay away from mentioning this school's name, but at the moment, it seems to be the only one that has all four year degrees. And I'll conclude by simply saying, and, and perhaps uh, Jasmine might wanna tack on something here, but the UGC, the University Grants Commission, <clears throat> really came down hard on the University of Delhi when they tried to introduce a four-year degree, a four-year arts degree, arts and science degree. So it seems odd then that uh, with three years being the norm in these disciplines, four years in those disciplines, to suddenly have the, the wires crossed and something different going on at a particular institution. And that's sort of where we are trying to run this thing down. Thanks, Robert. Yes, you're correct. When the UGC came down very hard on, on the institutions and threatened to withdraw funding. Um, and the, the, the argument or the case that these universities have is that they feel that their three-year degrees are not comprehensive enough, that they're not holistic enough, that uh, in order for the Indian uh, university degrees to be competitive on a global level, the four-year degree will be much more palatable, will have the that component of what we consider kind of our general education, that's kind of what they were looking into. I do recall that the UGC allowed a very handful of universities to make, hold on to that four year. Um, and they were mostly kind of the, 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 the institutes of technology, uh, but I don't think it, it applied to the universities, but maybe, I don't, I don't remember if this uh, four year bachelor was from a university. Um, the one that we were discussing. Do you recall, Robert, if it was a university? Yes, yes. It was. Um, Pandit uh, Dindial Petroleum University. Ah, and I, I have a strange feeling that they may have let one or two of them kind of <laughs> finish this off because there was a lot of uproar because students had enrolled, they were already in the program, and then right. to be told no. 
So it's an interesting thing, just like Morocco. The other possibility, <laughs> Jasmine, is, is that uh, Delhi, of course, is very high profile. Everyone. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. University of Delhi did not even participate in the new accreditation scheme of the NAAC. Ah, oh, interesting. And yeah. so they're very high profile. That's pro possibly why they drew the UGC's attention, whereas this, this small institution in the outskirts of Delhi, um, small private school, it's probably uh, much less noticeable, although by now I'm sure they do know, right, know all about right. it. <laughs> and if they're a private school, they may not be subject to the stringent well, that's funding good point. requirements. Yeah, they have no funding so, to take away from them. To yeah. take away from, yeah. It's to be continued. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, this, I think, Melanie, this is, uh, we're turning this over to the, the questions. Thank you so much. Um, we do have, thanks, thanks everyone for those great updates. The, the IESC has been hard at work. That's just some of the topics that they have covered since we last met. Uh, so they're, they're a very, very busy group. Couple of questions. The first question um, is really about the functioning of the IESC and how, um, how decisions are made and how voting is made. So the question is, is quorum required for voting decisions or is it often split among members? So I'm wondering if Jasmine, you might wanna talk a little bit about how the IESC comes to a decision on a credential. Thank you. And then I also invite the, the members of the council to, to add to this, but we, um, this is not a, a kind of a, <laughs> unitary kind of a decision. We do get together. We do look at the credentials ad nauseum. Um, we ask many questions from each other or the person who's doing the research. Uh, and we try to look at it in, from every angle to see that there's consistency, that we are not uh, giving a credential advice that may differ for the same sort of you know, standards that we've used. Uh, so that there won't be this um, issue that, well, why are you recommending X, Y, and Z for this particular credential from this country, but you're not using the same um, measuring stick or the sa standards for this. So once we have crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's, we present this as a vote. Um, and we do want a majority vote. We, things don't get split in the middle. We don't have a 50-50. We do, we do work really hard to reach a consensus. Um, that's that's my decision. Uh, you know, that's that's my takeaway from how uh, the ISC reaches these um, final decisions on the credential advice, the grading scale, the country profile reports. If there's anything anyone else wants to add, yeah, I, I I'd like to talk Bill. a little bit about um, how some how some of the voting on IESC evolved and how the template evolved. Uh, there are many of us who used to sit on the old National Council, and uh, the way the old council worked is you'd, somebody would do a book, and you'd spend a day or a couple of full days looking at the placement recommendations and talking about them. Sometimes these, the placement recommendations that came with these books were written individually, uh, and they really tended to vary. They dominated discussions. Uh, and I think really they led to confusion in the field. So one of the things we did when we created EDGE was to try to identify in, in, the, in a template, a series of placement recommendations that, are, that would apply to every credential in the world. So I think the template, can, well, it contained 29 the last time I took a close look at it. I don't know where it is now, but the template was developed over the course of the first, I would say five to seven years of EDGE with us adding individual uh, recommendations to the template. So historically, what, we've, what we're trying to do is establish continuity and clarity. I think we, we, don't, we don't see issues coming into edge like we used to with the old books uh, where people are confused or they're wondering what the council, they're reading into the, into the council's interpretation of what they think they see. So uh, I think it was a real step forward. And I think the, the group, the, the IESC group has just continued over the, you know, over the last past few years to just make it better. And so when you see a change, it's, it's considered, um, I'm really surprised, I'm not really surprised, but the real, there's really a lot of consensus 
in edge. I don't think we've ever had a split vote, frankly, in the time we've been doing it. We may have occasionally two people arguing different points of view, but they always work it out. And I, I and we have very rarely have things like four to one votes or three to two, but we never have three to two votes. It's, it's, yeah. it's always, it's always pretty consistent. Yes. Thank you, Bill. That's, okay. uh, that's, that's been my, uh, my experience. And I think, uh, the times that there may have been some disagreement, it's really, it's more uh, on a personal level, but we put that aside and we come together again and we use the standards that are applicable to how we reach the decision. So sometimes the personal side has to be you know, put on pause, but that's how we work very well together. So knock on wood, as they say, <laughs> it's, been, it's been good. <laughs> Any Thanks other so questions? Much. So a couple of other questions. Um, here's a question about Nepal. Do most universities consider the BDS from Nepal equivalent to a four-year regionally accredited domestic bachelor's degree? So I, I can take that and then my colleagues can chime in. Um, this is um, an interesting nuance about medical degrees in most other countries outside the United States in that it is usually a first university degree of five years duration or more. So it's very different in structure at the very least to the United States. Um, so we're talking about medical degrees, uh, dental medicine, veterinary medicine. And again, they're usually first university degrees of five years or more in length. And we usually, you'll find an edge, we uh, recommend them as being comparable to the first professional degree in that particular field. Now, if you're looking for a US bachelor's degree equivalent or something comparable to that, um, but we say first professional degree uh, equivalency, you can regard that I would say as satisfying that requirement, although we're not saying that it's comparable to a US bachelor's degree because it is a first university degree of more than four years in length. But of course you have to look at all your other requirements and of course look at the recognition of the institution. So that, that would be my take. I'm not sure if other colleagues wanna jump in on that particular question. I will have to echo what Emily said. Um, we apply that same principle when we do evaluations at ACEI. We look at the, the professional uh, credentials uh, from most countries where admission is based on completion of upper secondary school as a first professional degree. It's not I, we just don't look at it as a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Arts because we don't provide a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science, for example, in, in medicine. Um, this is a professional degree that requires pre-professional training at the university level for admission. So I, I echo what Emily just said. Any, any comments from others on the IASC? Okay, I hope that, okay. that helps. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, all right, another couple of questions. Um, for India, we see a lot of 10 plus 2 plus 3, where 3 yields a BTEC. How to discern if it's a terminal credential or can ladder into graduate studies? Big sender is PTU, IKG PTU now. So this is tangentially related to the diploma to, ba to bachelor presented by Dale. So I guess, is this a Dale question? Who wants to take this one? Nancy, probably. Uh, Nan yeah, it, it yeah. wasn't me. <laughs> if you, yeah. Hi, this is Nancy. If you clearly have a 10 plus two and you do not have a diploma in engineering issued by a board of technical education, that three-year Bachelor of Technology very well may be only three years of study. This may not be the situation where you have a diploma from a board of technical education. I have seen these three-year programs, Bachelor of Technology programs that are indeed the admission, it's very clearly in the um, University's Handbook of India that admission is the 10 plus two followed by three years of study. You really should check uh, the university website or the Indian University's uh, handbook, yearbook, um, or ask for a diploma in technical 
um, a diploma of engineering from Board of Technical Education. If hypothetically you have the 10 plus two and the, the 12 year higher secondary certificate is hypothetically 2015 and in 2018 you have a three year Bachelor of Technology and you check your resources, you very well may find that is a three year program only and not a four year program. These are few and far between, but it seems like they're becoming more popular. And with, as I always say in India, it's like putting a puzzle together and you need to make sure all the pieces fit. And in India, there are always exceptions to the rule. Hope that helps. Thanks so much, Nancy. So I have another question and actually I may have to ask the asker to, I may have to ask them to unmute and um, clarify because I think this is a, a more complicated question. It says, because you're US based, can you speak to electric, electronic sending of high school transcripts direct from high schools to colleges and unis in USA due to COVID? We are getting emails asking to do that and want to make a best practice decision on the matter. And so in order to answer, uh, Robert has something to say right away. So maybe I will let him start. I can see he's, oh no, he's not. Are you, are you uh, yeah. raising your hand? Um, okay. You're gonna do TEA, Robert? Is that that who is at uh, university? I would simply say, well, first of all, it's kind of not an edge question in the sense that we're more about credentials, content, what they mean and so forth, than we are um, institutional best practices uh, with respect to official versus unofficial um, and that sort of thing. That being said, uh, I think um, most of us are leery of electronic documents. Um, we also, many of us are, are Mem uh, have attended uh, Groningen Declaration Network uh, conferences where the hope down the road is, is from my server to your server uh, and no, no more paper and no more touching of paper and it's from one entity to another and there it is, safe, secure, and complete. Um, this year, of course, we've been under tremendous pressure by applicants to um, especially if you have online programs where they're not generally gonna come into your office and bring paper anyway, but we're under tremendous pressure to take all sorts of things. Um, first of all, let me just say UT Austin, we, we are already accept uploads, all right? So basically someone takes an official document, that's a real document that I normally want, would want them to bring into the office and they upload it onto their record and we'll use that. Uh, we'll use it, make a decision off of it, and then if admitted, and if they decide to come, they must produce in person that original document they uploaded. Um, if not, they don't get to register. But with COVID, it's been a little bit different situation where we've had both virtual and in person at UT Austin. Um, most of uh, all of us are generally working from home, though we do have one person go in each day to, to open mail and do a few other things. I guess what I'd say is it's really up to the institution. You're gonna to have to decide, is what I'm looking at secure? Is it accurate? What was the source? And, and make a decision, do you, you wanna use it initially and then later on get something that's official paper? That's gonna be something you'll have to decide. What, oh. Oh. One of the things that, one of the things that um, the universities do is process with things that are not originals and bar upon enrollment for take, getting the original. So for example, when I was at UT, we, we, we process for graduate admissions, pretty much anything, copies, et cetera. But then if the student enrolled, one of the conditions upon, for enrollment was that they present original documents and they might get away with a semester of enrollment uh, in order to get the original document to us, but come December, say, in their first, at the end of their first term, if they had not presented the original document, they faced, uh, they, they, they wouldn't be allowed to come back. 
uh, we found that in well over 95% of the cases, this works. That you got the registrar wound up with original documents. The, the departments were happy because what they were able to do was simply consider the student, which is the departments are always interested in doing. Uh, and I know like at the undergraduate level, many institutions are really interested in enrolling international students. So a flexible approach to how you accept and process documents I, is the way I would recommend that you go. Uh, and that means you, you can process with unofficial documents, but you must get originals in, uh, in the final analysis. Thanks, Bill. I also want to point all of the listeners to the ACRO report on inclusive admissions for displaced and vulnerable persons, which outlines a set of best practices as described, as we just described, that talks about the ways in which you can be flexible in crisis during, uh, during uh, the admission process to receive documents and then the follow-up that you must do afterwards. So uh, that link to that report is in the chat. So we have five minutes left. So I think we have time for one more question. And let's see, there are several, so I'm afraid we're not gonna get to them all. So I'm going to say um, a question that says, um, has there been a change in the Iranian secondary education where students can no longer complete one year of pre-university studies prior to starting university in Iran? And I think I'm going to pass that to Jasmine. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie, because I just saw that too. And I went to our um, Acro Edge profile on Iran. So if uh, the question, the person who's asking you a question, I would love to recommend you to go to the page and you will see that there have been changes that were proposed and uh, put into place. So effective 20, 2014, the system has reverted to the, its former uh, uh, education uh, cycle of six plus, six plus six, meaning six years of uh, primary followed by six years of lower secondary and upper secondary combined. So we have now a 12 year system. Um, the one year pre-university is, is provided, but uh, there is now a 12 year high school system. So that's the update that we have posted on Acro Edge. So you will, not, you will no longer be seeing the 11 year uh, high school uh, completion certificate after 2014. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask one more question because I think we can squeeze one more in relatively quickly. Um, can you talk a little about the polytechnic institutions and community colleges from Singapore? How are they seen? Are they equivalent to high school programs or higher? Anyone on the panel have uh, any experience there? Or yes, Melanie. Uh, at UT Austin, we saw a number uh, for a while. We haven't as much lately, but while Bill was still there um, as our assistant dean. I'm still here. We, yeah. <laughs> uh, when you were at UT, I meant. Um, we came across um, so a couple of Singapore Polytechnic um, and oh, I'm blanking out on the other, um, but these were very, Singapore. very rigorous programs. Um, they Singapore. weren't full degree programs because they weren't allowed to, they didn't have degree granting authority. Um, but they were very good programs, so that we had no difficulty whatsoever um, awarding transfer credit towards a U.S. bachelor's degree in that same field of engineering. Um, sometimes, I'm not always confident with that. Um, I mean, in other countries, sometimes um, polytechnic um, diploma, sub-degree diplomas are very technical in nature and not generally um, should be given credit towards a bachelor of science and something engineering at a US college or university. But I felt very strongly that the polytechnics in Singapore were very, very much um, acceptable from pretty much day one because their entrance criteria is the same as that for universities. So, um, yeah. so we didn't have any real, well, you might be able to get in without having to do the, the Singapore Cambridge A-levels, um, but, but that's okay by me. 
And uh, but I so I was more than happy to give transfer credit for everything they did there at those at those scores and the grade very severely. You know, the I, I think the two Robert were Singapore and Malta. And what we did with both of them also was after um, they enrolled for a year, we ran a study that looked at their grade point averages at UT. And I think they were both like universally 4.0s. So I forgot that's, something that people, that's something that people don't do very much in international admissions, but they should, which is, you know, if you've got a question about how well somebody's going to do at your institution, wait a year, go back, look at how they've done. That'll confirm your judgment one way or the other. Excellent, excellent point, Bill. And, and I 100% agree that if there are cases that you're making exceptions on, if you yep. go back and follow the progress of those students, you will, you will know relatively quickly whether or not you made a good decision and whether you should right. make that same decision again. Right. And I think we, with that, we are out of time. So I want to very, give a very special set of thank yous to um, all of my hardworking colleagues who joined us today and took time away from their own work to share with us. Um, as a reminder, the work done by the IESC, the folks here on this, on this uh, call, is on a volunteer basis and their dedication to this work is very much appreciated by ACRO and also by me personally. So thank you for being here. Um, this is one of the most valuable aspects of ACRO and the EDGE community, the network of colleagues that we can call upon to support each other, especially during these challenging times. Next slide. Drew, do you wanna talk very briefly about the IESC fellows? Very briefly. So uh, one of the things that we've been discussing is the importance of doing primary research when you're coming up with policies and how you're going to enact those uh, within your own offices. Um, one of the things that uh, we're providing an opportunity for is to learn with the IESC some of those best practices. Um, if you're within the first five years of um, evaluating international credentials, um, we invite you to apply for an IESC fellowship. Uh, you, if selected, you would be given an opportunity to participate on the calls. They happen twice a month. Um, you would be assigned a research project and you would be working with members of the IESC on how to develop that and how you can find this information. Um, it, there's a lot to take in and there are um, methods that you should use when you're doing this. Um, the IESC fellowship, there's information available uh, on the website. I'll put the link into the chat about how to get there. but. Um, Basically, when you're all done, you're going to be able to, and you will be expected to, present at the annual meeting on whatever the topic is, uh, and you'll be, um, you'll be brushing shoulders with some folks that uh, have the experience that will really put you on a good path uh, along your, uh, your career trajectory. So. Thanks, Drew. Next slide. I just want to remind the folks on this call, if you are if you have a, a passion project, if you have some research in a country that you would like to dig into and have a plan in place, I might suggest you apply for funding from the Gloria Nathanson Research Fund for International Education. This, uh, this fund will make awards up to $1,000 to support travel, research materials, and other direct costs that are related to international education research. We'll fund full country profile updates, substantive updates, white papers on topics of interest, and lots of other topics. So if you have any interest, please reach out to us. Next slide. You can stay informed in what's going on at ACRO by joining the EDGE mailing list, joining the International Activities Listserv, or subscribing to the ACRO Connect newsletters. The EDGE mailing list and the listserv are available on the EDGE profile. Connect are the, is the, new, the news stories that are at the bottom of the profile and you can subscribe by clicking through to the ACRO Connect page on the ACRO website. Stay informed and don't miss everything that's going on at ACRO. Next slide. And finally, I wanna put in one great plug for the last webinar of the fall season. Um, in the international group, and that is on December 3rd, 
Our colleague Ann Koenig will be presenting on Uzbekistan 2030, the Silk Road to Internationalizing Higher Education. I hope that you will join us uh, for that uh, webinar, which will be very interesting. Um, also, just as a reminder, the Cuba White Paper has recently been released, and the link to that is was in the chat a little earlier, or you can go to the ACRO website. In addition, we also have a new publication on uh, holistic admissions processes. I want to thank you all for joining us this Tuesday afternoon. I hope that you will get some extra time off this week and that we are at the end or close to the end of your week. Enjoy the rest of your week and have a wonderful holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Happy